you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions about any of the stuff we covered so far? No. Okay. Well, there's no questions. I'm just going to carry on. So we're in chapter two. Um, and so we finished the electronegativity. Just a reminder that um, we have these numbers that tell us if things are going to share electrons or if they're going to steal electrons or if they're going to share equally or unequally. And that really defines all the bonds. So you guys are going to need to know uh, ionic, covalent, and then we have to distinguish between the covalent bonds because we have, so we have ionic, which is the transfer of electrons, and then covalent, which is the share of electrons. And then a subgroup of this is that it's either polar. Remember poles mean charge, just like the North and South Pole. So these aren't gonna share equally and the, and the molecule will have a slight charge um, we call that a sigma charge, so partial charge. And then it can be nonpolar, and this means that they share equally, um, and that means that there's no charge. And charges are going to be a big deal because water, um, we talked about water, and we're going to talk about water, the whole chapter three is about water. So remember, uh, in this, the electronegativity of oxygen is 3.5 and hydrogen is 2.1. So they don't share equally at all. They still share, but the electrons spend the majority of their time spinning around oxygen. So let's say they would go around oxygen 10 times for every one time around hydrogen. And that means that since the electrons negatively charged, it's going to be more negative on oxygen and more positive on hydrogen. This is what makes water super unique and important for life. It's these un, this unequal sharing, um, this polar, these polar covalent bonds between oxygen and hydrogen. So just a little foreshadowing, you need to know that, especially for the next chapter. So make sure you guys sit down and write down the definition of ionic and covalent and polar versus nonpolar. And remember the electronegativity differences 0.5 or less then they share equally. If it's bigger than that, then they share unequally. Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is chemical reactions. So we were just talking about good old water and to make water, you need the parts, right? It's like, if you're going to build the Lego, a fire truck, you need all the Lego parts to make the fire truck. So we know the parts of water are H, hydrogen, and O, oxygen, and we need two of these for every one of these. And it has to do with the valence of oxygen. What's the valence of oxygen? It's a quick quiz. Make sure you guys know this. So valence of oxygen is two. That means it can form two bonds. And what's the valence of hydrogen? Is it one? It's one, right? So it can form one bond. So that's why water, oxygen needs to form two bonds, right? So if you're drawing this out, you know it's automatically got two sticks on it. Hydrogen needs to form one. So this is why water is the way it is. Um, and it's it's bent like this, the way I draw it like this instead of straight across like this is because those negative charges repel those positive charges. So it ends up bending it. So it really has this shape because it's negative up here and positive here. Not a full charge, remember it's a sigma charge. But anyway, so to make water, we need hydrogen and oxygen. Remember the octet rule? So Hydrogen would never exist by itself. If there was just a hydrogen, it wouldn't have a full outer shell because it only has one electron. So it would wander the earth until it found something else that it could share with. And so it just turns out usually that if there's one hydrogen, there's another one and they share and make a bond. So hydrogen is always found as H2. 
in nature. It wouldn't exist just by itself for very long. And oxygen's the same way. Remember it has two, so this is a double bond. It's not drawn very well by the artist, but, and this is a single bond. So oxygen shares uh, two pairs of electrons. That's how it has this full outer shell. And uh, we talked about this when we were talking about co uh, covalent bonds. Is this polar or nonpolar? If I put this on the test, what would you say? Is that polar? Remember, polar means that they share unequally. Oh, so for oxygen? Think, oxygen has the same strength as oxygen. So nonpolar? Yeah, then they share. So this is nonpolar. And this is going to be important later on when we talk about how things cross the membrane um, when we get to chapter uh, six and seven. All right. So these are hydrogen shares equally with other hydrogens because they have the same electronegativity, the same strength. So if we subtract 2.1 from 2.1, we get zero. And that means it's sharing and it's sharing equally. So it's nonpolar. Oxygen 3.5 minus 3.5 equals zero. So again, nonpolar. All right. So we have uh since we have H2 always existing together, we can't split them apart. And O2 always existing together, we can't split them apart. We have to write this equation as H2 plus O2 yields H2O. Now we got a problem here because we got two H's and two O's here, and we only have one H2O, and we have to balance this equation. So that means that everything we start with, we have to end with, right? If you uh, have extra pieces when you're building your Lego fire truck, uh, then it doesn't, it's not, it's missing pieces, right? And uh, if you don't have enough, then you can't finish the project. So we're going to have to add numbers in front of this. Um, the easiest way to do this is to split it up. And this is how I do it. I mean, if you guys have a better way, I don't care as long as you get to the right answer. So I take the number of oxygens. So this side of the equation is called the reactant. So we're going to take our reactants first. So how many uh, oxygen reactants do we have here? Two. Yep. And how many hydrogens? One. Well, remember, it's they're paired oh, together. So. And this is the product. So I'll just draw a line between these. So this is the product. There could be more than one. But in just in this case, it's a product of the reaction. So remember, we have reactants. They're what react. And then products is just what's produced. So like what's made, right? Okay, so on this side we have oxygen. How many do we have? We just have one, right? It's this one right here. And then hydrogen, how many do we have? Two. Right. So we know we need at least an extra oxygen on this side, right? And the only way to get there is to put a two in front of this. Right, so we have two oxygens. But when we do that, we actually end up with four hydrogens. I'm just making this darker so I don't have to switch to the eraser. So now we have two oxygens and four hydrogens. Everybody see that? Yeah. All right, so now we gotta, we gotta fix that. So we gotta make this four so that they'll be equal. And to do that, we have to add a two in front of this. That makes this four oxygens two, this oxygens two, this hydrogens four. So now it's balanced. We call balanced. What we start with is the same as what we finish with. 
we can't you'll learn this when we get further on but you can't uh, matter can't be created or destroyed it can only change forms and so we can't just destroy oxygen or hydrogen it goes against this uh, law of thermodynamics that I'll talk about um, as we go on. Turns out thermodynamics is a super important law that prevents us from doing time travel, which Stephen Hawking might argue with me, but I could I would argue with him that he's wrong. It's not possible because of the laws of thermodynamics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to that chapter. All right. So on the test, you guys are going to be asked to balance equations. Um, and so let's, let's try one. A super common one in biology. And then uh, hopefully you guys will get the hang of it. So we'll just, uh, we'll do it over here on the side of the slide. So here we have, uh, Plants take in carbon dioxide. This is photosynthesis. So plants take in carbon dioxide and water. And they produce glucose, which is C6, H12O6, and then plus oxygen. So you guys probably learned this in seventh grade science class. Plants take in carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen. Well, to do this reaction, what they're making is glucose, which is, they store this as an energy source so they can have it overnight. So this, remember the energy from the sun, which is what kind of energy, kinetic or potential? Kinetic. Kinetic. Uh, is convert as plants do this and we'll get into detail on how they do this when we get to chapter 10. Um, so plants take energy from the sun. They use it to put into these energy poor molecules to make energy rich molecules, which are these. And then oxygen is released as a byproduct as a gas. Remember oxygen always has to be O2 because of this octet rule. So anyway, um, and then plants store this glucose so they can make it through the night. So the, there's energy in this, these chemical bonds, right? The, there's no, nothing different between either side of these. They'll all add up when we get to the, when we balance it. So the energy is in the actual bonds, the arrangement, the structure. You can kind of think of it as a spring, right? So a spring, you're not changing anything when you compress it, you push it down. But if you don't push it down, then it wouldn't like launch a tennis ball. But if you compress it, if you change its shape, now it has more energy and it can launch a tennis ball or a potato or whatever. So uh, it's the shape of this glucose that gives it energy. And the only thing that's different is that the chemical bonds, these bonds, that's why bonds are important. So, um, Plants take the energy from sunlight, which is kinetic energy, and they convert it to the energy in glucose, which is, what's glucose? It's a chemical. Sugar? So it's a, right, it's a sugar. Mm -hmm. It's a chemical. So they convert it to the chemical energy in bonds. And what kind of energy is in chemical bonds? Kinetic or potential? Potential. Potential, right. Yeah, it doesn't get... Your Snickers bar always has 240 calories unless you break it down. So now we have to balance this thing. So we'll just do the same trick. We got carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens on one side. And what are these called? Reactants or products? Reactants. Awesome. And carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen over here. And what are these called? Reactants or products? Product. Good. So make sure you guys know that for the test. How many carbons on this side? One. Awesome. How many hydrogens? Two. Perfect. And how many oxygens? Three. Yep. Good job. All right. On this side, how many carbons? Six. Six. How many hydrogens? 
12. And how many oxygen? Mom, that's Perfect. So right away, you can see that we have six over here. And we have one over here. We have to make this at least a six because we can't create molecules. So we have to put a six here. Did we see that? Yeah. Okay. Now we have 12 of these. And so once we do the six, let's just change this number. So this changes our oxygens. So now we have six times two is 12 plus one. That actually gives us 13 oxygens, but it didn't change the hydrogen. So we're cool there. We have 12 here and only two here. So we have to multiply that by six to get 12 on this side. Everyone agree? Yeah. We're gonna have to put a six here. There's no other option because we have to end up with 12 to make glucose. So now we have 12, but that also changed our oxygen. So now we have six times two is 12 oxygens. And then now we have six more, which makes this 18. Does everybody see that? Yeah. All right, so how do we get 18 oxygens on this side? We have A. Can we put, if we put a number in front of here, it's going to screw up everything else. So we're going to try to stick to this side. What number could I put in front of this oxygen to uh, make it uh, eight? eight? Sorry, 18. So we have six. What could I put? What do I need to add to six to get 18? You put an eight there? Well, that would, if I put an eight there, that would give us 16 plus six, right? Oh. So six plus 12 is 18. So how do I get 12 here? Right here. You put a six in front of it. Six times two is 12, right? Yeah. Plus six is 18. So they're the same on each side. So this is a perfectly balanced equation. And on the test, you guys are gonna to need to be able to do this. So um, in the syllabus, I, I put a link to a book uh, that's ch uh, called Chemistry for Biology Students. And it has practice problems in there, practice balancing and practice valence and stuff. Um, you could also just do a Google search on balancing chemical equations. Um, and there's YouTube videos and uh, Crash Course has that. Uh, Khan Academy has that. Um, and there are uh, other just worksheet problems that you could do to practice balancing these equations. But you're gonna need to know how to do this because it's super important in, in biology to be able to do this. Any questions about that? No. Okay, so this is the balanced equation, right? Uh, plants take in carbon dioxide and water. They give off glucose and oxygen. We have to add sixes in front of all of these to make everything balanced. Um, and then you guys know the reactants are carbon dioxide and water and the products are glucose and oxygen. So good job. All right, so This uh, reactions can go in either direction. So I'll give you an example, and we're gonna we're gonna actually do this in class. So we got six CO two plus six H two O. H two O yields C six H twelve O six plus six oxygen. So we just said that that's photosynthesis. And this is the molecule that has energy that plants store. Um, you guys, when you eat carbs, your body uses that for energy. So you can do the reaction in the opposite direction. In fact, you take in glucose and combine it with oxygen that you breathe and you give off water and carbon dioxide. So that's called respiration. And everybody's doing it right now, unless you're holding your breath. 
uh, this is chapter nine, and this is how we make it, our energy from the foods we eat. There's not a lot of things that you can get energy from. You can't get energy from dirt or bark. Um, it's pretty much laid out on your nutritional label. The only things that you can get energy from are carbs. And then there's simple ones, which are simple sugars like glucose. And then there's complex, which are sugars linked together. Um, and you guys did this in the chemistry lab or you're doing this in the chemistry lab. So like maltose is two glucoses linked together and that's considered a complex carb. And then we have fats, right? So if you look on any nutritional label, you'll see that you can use fats. And then we have saturated and non-saturated. And then there's trans, there's trans fat and cis fat. Trans means across, like if you're gonna take a transatlantic voyage, you go across the Atlantic. And cis is a, probably a new word to you. That means same. Um, but we'll talk about the fats when we get to the chapter five and the carbs. So this is all going to be in chapter five. And then the last thing, well, it's not true. There's one other thing, but what's the other thing that you can get energy from on your nutritional label? You can get calories from. Anybody know? Protein. Yeah, protein. Which you guys are going to look, you're going to build your you're not really building them. Like if it was an in-person class, you'd build the models with balls and sticks, but you're gonna do it on that piece of paper by uh, sort of combining the parts of proteins, parts of fats and parts of carbs to make them uh, complex. You're gonna make, um, uh, there's different kinds of fats. So the kind of fat you're gonna make is a triglyceride, which is what your body uses as energy. And then proteins, you're going to build proteins and they're made out of amino acids. So this is really all your body can use for energy. And this is really all the things that are on your nutritional label, except alcohol. It's not really talked about, but you could actually live off alcohol too, because your body can use this as an energy source. But these four things, that's it. That's all you can use for energy as humans. Um, Oh, actually animals, that's all they can use. And so when we do a reaction in one direction and we can also do the reaction in the other direction, that means that the reactions can go forward and backwards. And if they're going forwards, so if plants are doing photosynthesis at the same rate they're doing respiration, which they do, right? Because when it gets dark, they can't do photosynthesis anymore. They have to, unless they can hold their breath overnight, they have to do what we do, which is respiration. And so when it gets to be, you know, dusk, when it's almost dark, the rate of photosynthesis is almost equal, well, it equals the rate of respiration. And we call that chemical equilibrium. That means the forward reaction equals the reverse reaction. And this is really important to know if you're like, you know, growing uh, fruits or vegetables or other things in a, in a greenhouse, you would want to know where this chemical equilibrium occurs because it's super important to the health of plants. All right, any questions about that? No. Okay. All right, I made links to this. It's not really an assignment. It's just, it's extra stuff that you can do to learn. The links are on under pages um, in Canvas. Um, and then if you just go to uh, a, the Atom, then you can, you can do these simulations. Um, there's a, you know, various like little, some people are visual learners. So there's a lot of videos and stuff in there. It's kind of a shame that they took away Flash because that kind of wrecked a lot of websites. But I think these mostly work. I can't vouch for what is in Flash and what isn't. But it's just an extra learning guide. And again, you guys can do the crash course. I have those linked out. So just look up chemistry or you know under the biology thing. Uh, there's Khan Academy. 
uh, and there's other you know videos on YouTube. If you're a visual learner, this is kind of helpful. I'm I'm kind of a visual learner, but they don't give me enough money to do green screen stuff, so I leave it to the guys that have a million subscribers. Any questions about chapter two? No. Okay, so that's the end of chapter two. Again, you know, uh, what I recommend is you guys uh, listen to the lectures and go over the PowerPoints. So do the lecture plus the PowerPoints and then take notes. And then and then see what you know, what you remember and what you know. Um, and then and then focus on the things that you need to work on. Right. Um, and so the thing, so once you go through the notes, once you've made notes, um, I want you to go through the crossword. You don't have to do the crosswords, like I said in the video. Just make sure that you know the definitions of all those words on the crossword puzzle. Because the, you know, this is the foreign language component of biology. You need to know what those words mean so that you can uh, talk like a biologist. And then do the study guides. So if you can answer the crosswords and the study guides without referring back to your notes, then you're good for the test. And then um, anything that's not covered on the study guides or the crosswords, because I this isn't exhausted, uh, go back through your notes and then uh, study that stuff and then take the quiz and if you can do well on the quiz without notes then you're gonna you'll do well on the exam for sure um i have a question sure. i was gonna do um chapter one quiz and it said that it's locked until the 20th i think are you gonna open those up so we're able to do the quizzes before the test or before yeah that, it's, or it's not supposed to be locked um uh, it may just be a setting that i didn't um click so let me just uh See if I can find a pen. My kids run off with all my pens to do drawings. Oh, no, that's all right. Um, okay, so I'll look at the chapter one quizzes. There's all the quizzes are supposed to be open. They're not supposed to be locked. So. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. No sometimes I screw up. So, if you guys have any questions like that, let me know. Anything else? No, that's it. All right, so we're going to move on to chapter three. Okay, let me center this. All right, so so this chapter has to do with water, like I sort of told you guys before. And so you already know a little bit about water. You know that water is made out of oxygen and hydrogens that they don't share electrons, that the electrons spin around oxygen more than hydrogen. So this has a partial negative charge and this has a partial positive charge. Now remember the bonds are made by pairs of electrons. So that's why there's four, because there's four pairs of electrons in um, this molecule. And it needs that because 
It has to have eight to be happy. It, sorry, if you change your slide, we can't see it. Oh, okay, hang on. It's weird. It should have kept it open in, uh, in PowerPoint. Let me see what's going on here. New share. All right. Thank you for bringing that up. So can you see now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we know that uh, water is made up of oxygen and hydrogens, right? And that the electrons spin more around oxygen, which gives it a partial negative charge than it does around hydrogen, which gives it a partial positive charge. And that there's the, I'm writing four of these on here because these each represent a pair of electrons. Remember, a pair of electrons equals a chemical bond in covalent in covalent bonds. So this is a shared pair of electrons. This is a shared pair of electrons here. Shared pair, shared pair, and that's what makes a bond. So this represents a shared pair. This represents a shared pair. This represents a pair. It's not shared because oxygen just kept it since it has eight. And that also represents a pair. So remember, oxygen has one, two, three, four pairs of electrons in its outer shell. And that's the octet rule. Remember, for anything above hydrogen, it's eight. Hydrogen has to have two in its outer shell, which we just talked about. Okay, so that makes water unique. There's no other molecule that's kind of like it that has this really big unequal sharing of electrons, these polar covalent bonds. So, you know, this is just a little trivia, but you should also know this. So water is the only molecule on the planet Earth that exists in a solid, liquid, and gas phase all at the same time. So we, we you, sometimes we call this dew or, or uh, uh, water vapor. Um, and this is what comes out of the uh, out of the air and like you know makes your cup sweat and things like that. So there's vapor waters in as a gas, and then you guys know liquid water exists in rivers and oceans and whatever. And that you know and and the poles that uh, it can also exist as a solid. So this is unique to water. No other molecule exists like this. Um, so it has this big range, and there's a reason for this uh this big range and it has to do with that those partial charges that we talked about that are on oxygen and hydrogen so this molecule is drawn with the space filling electrons so that's why it has this cloud around it so this is water oxygen and hydrogen and so we know that hydrogen has a partial positive charge and oxygen has a partial Negative, and what happens when you put negatives and positives together? They attract, right? So if you're, if you look at a glass of water, um, it's all these oxygens and hydrogens floating around in it, you know, the water molecules that are linked together, and they're gonna sit around like this, just hanging out in your glass. But what's really going on in there is that hydrogen is par partial charge. I'm gonna leave off the sigma thing for now. And oxygen is partial negative charge. So this is attracted. They're not the same molecule, right? This is one molecule and this is another molecule, but they're still attracted to each other. And this attraction is called a hydrogen bond, which is shown right here. And 
remember we have four of these partial charges because of the location of the electrons. So this is going to have another negative partial charge and it's going to make another hydrogen bond with this one. So remember these are separate, but they're attracted to each other. And so that this is also a hydrogen bond. Same thing here. And so, so they don't really like connect. They just kind of float around each other. Yeah, think yeah. of it as a person, right? So like you, people can't go around ripping your arms off. But if you're holding hands, then there's strength in that. So if you know okay. someone's stage diving or whatever, as long as you're holding hands, uh, it's it's gonna you know you're gonna form sort of a bond or a connection. You know that's a lot weaker than say someone you know jumping on you. It's not gonna cause you to fall apart. So water molecules have strong bonds in them. The covalent bonds, remember, are they're twenty times stronger than hydrogen bonds. But this still counts, and so these bonds right here are kind of like water holding hands with each other. And that gives it a lot of unique properties that we're going to talk up uh, about in this chapter. So one important thing, and I'll ask you on the test, is how many hydrogen bonds is the maximum number of hydrogen bonds water can form? Four. And the answer is four. Yeah. And the reason is, is because of those, uh, those four paired electrons this is a pair right between hydrogen and oxygen so each of these can make a bond and that's one two three four all right so that makes water pretty cool that video doesn't work this video doesn't work um okay so since water molecules hold hands with through these hydrogen bonds, they create something called cohesion. Cohesion is water being attracted to itself. Right? Ooh. Come on. Water is attracted to itself uh, through these hydrogen bonds, right? Kind of like holding hands. And you see this all the time. Now, if you don't believe me, go get a glass of water and fill it up. And you'll see that water molecules stick together, right? Or pour some water on the counter and you'll see that it makes these blobs because water likes to stick together. So that's what causes the property of cohesion. Um, and it's an important biological property. There's also something called, uh, so cohesion creates surface tension. Um, and we kind of talked a little bit about this in the intro class, uh, the intro lecture, but um, water molecules are kind of hanging on to each other. And so if it's kind of like a stage diver. So if a bug or something uh, is to step on water, then it can't actually, it doesn't break the surface sort of hand holding that's going on. And that creates something called surface tension, which is a force that's needed to break the surface of water. And you can see this pretty easily. You can go do an experiment on your own. If you have a paper clip, a regular paper clip, um, and a glass of water, if not one with cuts in it, but a, just a plain flat surface paper clip, you can actually set that paper clip on the surface of that cup of water and it will stay there. And the reason it does is because the surface tension isn't broken. Once you break the surface tension, it's kind of like someone falling, you know, from a higher place. So it's going to pass through that and it's going to gain momentum and it's easier to break the subsequent layers of water underneath. And so if you push on that paper clip, you'll see that it will sink all the way to the bottom. Um, and that's what we call surface tension. 
but it also allows water bugs to walk on the water. And, you know, there's other things that can do that too. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's a lizard uh, called a basculus. How to stop buffering issues anywhere, anytime, instantly. Great, that's good. Enough. Some young Costa Rican basilisk lizards are looking for food. Basilisks have been nicknamed the Jesus Christ lizard. Why? This adult male, probably the father of the young lizards, can't tell us. Nor can this female, exclusive property of the territorial male. It has nothing to do with the feeding habits of the basilisk, which consists primarily of insects and berries. This predatory reptile will help reveal the secret as it stalks the young basilisk. The basilisk is called the Jesus Christ lizard because it can walk, and, well, it can run on water. It bicycles its hind legs, and the tail becomes a counterweight. We can't know what the snake is thinking. Did it really want to eat the lizard, or did it just want to show? So anyway, uh, let's let me make sure I close this. A country in Central America has become the kingdom of two very different lizards. So you could even walk on water. Uh, if you did the math to, to maintain the surface tension, you'd have to run somewhere close to a couple hundred miles an hour and have really, really big feet, like size 28. But you could do that as well. And that's due to surface tension and cohesion. Do you guys have any questions about that? No. Okay. So you need to know that word cohesion. So you should put that on your list of vocabulary words to know and also surface tension. And that's kind of why I've highlighted it and underlined it. All right, so cohesion does other things besides surface tension. It actually uh, can help with the transport of water in plants. Remember plants, uh, so if you want your nutrients to circulate around your body, so like the food you eat, right? You want it to get to your skin cells and your brain cell and all those other places away from your stomach and your intestines. What do you use to circulate your, your energy? Your sugars. Pancreas? Well, the, the answer is your blood, right? Your blood transports the sugars and nutrients around your body to various places. And plants have to do that too. So your blood is kind of like uh, water. It can dissolve things, not fats. So we need helpers like uh, proteins that can dissolve fats. But for the most part, it's, it's taking things that can be dissolved in water and transporting them. But, and what pumps your blood? Your heart. Yeah. Do you, do you guys know much about plants? Do they have hearts? No. No, they're heartless. So plants, they have a root system and a trunk system, right? And then they have their leaves out here 
the top. I know this is a terrible tree, but you get the idea, right? Yeah. So where to, so where is the water found and the nutrients found in this plant here that I've drawn? In the soil. The right. The roots of the soil. And so how do plants get the nutrients from the soil up to the leaves? Their roots. Yeah, but what moves it? Like they don't have a heart to pump it like you do. So how do they get it to move up? And the answer is all of these water molecules that are in here, they're all holding hands. Like we talked about through hydrogen bonds. And you guys know about evaporation. Yeah. So when one of these water molecules leaves, what do you think it does to the one next to it? Pulls it, it pulls out. it with it. And all these other ones get pulled up just like a rope. So that's how plants transport things from the soil to the leaves by using this cohesive property of water being attracted to other water molecules. So that's cohesion. Do you guys have any questions about cohesion? No. And why it's important? Okay. So adhesion is water. So adhesion is water attracted to other objects. So here, uh, this would be the attractive attraction of water to say plastic or glass or other things. So you can sort of do this trick and, and show that this property of adhesion is really real. So uh, when you put something, a cork or something in the ocean and the waves come along, where does the cork go? To the highest place or the lowest place? Uh, highest. Yeah. And so this glass, the water is attracted to the glass. So it pulls up on the edges like this. And by the way, this is called a meniscus when it pulls these edges up. And this is important when you're measuring drugs, you have to measure from the bottom of the meniscus and not the top, because then you would give the patient too little uh, drug or you know IV or whatever. So the cork is gonna sit on the side of this glass because that's the highest point. Well, once you fill it up, water is also attracted to the edge of this glass. So you're gonna get a reverse meniscus at the top and so what's the highest point here in the middle? And so I love, I used to love doing this to my kids because they're like, oh, you're a magician. You just fill it up and it moves. But that's due to the property. It's due to science, not magic. Um, and this property called adhesion. Any questions about adhesion? All right, so make sure you guys understand cohesion. You should be able to define that. Uh, I'm guarantee you that's on the crossword adhesion. I'm sure that this is on the crossword meniscus. Make sure you know what that is. That's an important term, new term maybe. So make sure you know all this. All right. So carrying on, we're going to talk about heat and temperature. So you guys probably know about temperature. You go outside. It's you know, you might ask ask your robot. I'm not going to say her name because she's right here, but. Uh, What's the temperature outside? You know, I don't know, maybe it's 70 degrees here. And in science, we use Celsius. I don't really care that you guys get into Celsius right now. Um, I'd rather you focus on using the metric system. And that's why we have that metric system lab uh, for other things besides temperature. But so let's just say it's 70 degrees outside. And, you know, the sun's going to be out and it, it may warm up to 80 for all I know. So what causes this change in temperature? Why is it at 80 instead of 70? And of course, it feels warmer, but what, what really causes that? And that uh, heat? Well, temperature and heat are two different things. Um, what causes this is something called kinetic energy. You guys know about kinetic energy. This is the energy of motion. Sunlight is kinetic energy. 
you running down the street is kinetic energy. Your car driving down the street is kinetic energy. Anything that's moving is kinetic energy. It has that kind of energy. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of a substance. So in this case, this would be the air, right, outside. That's what we're measuring. And when we increase uh, the kinetic energy, the temperature goes up. So I know that this is going to be weird for you. Because you're used to talking about increasing temperature, but you have to increase the kinetic energy before you can even do anything with temperature because they're directly related to each other. And so what causes this to go from 70 to 80 is that the kinetic energy uh, in the air is energized by the energy from the sun and that causes the molecules to move faster kind of like a hot air balloon so you know when you heat up a hot air balloon it expands and it gets big and then there's a difference in pressures and anyway it can float away so you know as you increase the temperature you're increasing the or as you increase the kinetic energy of a molecule of a substance you're changing the temperature of that substance so if I took a glass of water, and let's say it's room temperature, 70 degrees, close enough, and I drop an ice cube in it, what am I doing to that glass? Are you slowing down the energy? Right. I'm reducing the kinetic energy. And we can measure this, and, and we'll talk about it when we get to the energy chapter. But uh, that's what we're doing. And then this is going to go down. Maybe it goes down to 60 because this ice is taking out energy from the water. And if I put, you know, a fire under it, then I would add energy in. And that's how I can adjust the temperature by changing the kinetic energy. Remember that the key word here is average. Heat is a measure of the total kinetic energy. You can kind of think about it this way. So let's say that you went to the gym and you uh, bench pressed, uh, I don't know, just let's just say 200 pounds. And you did five sets and you did 10 reps per set. So you've lifted this 50 times. So what's the average of amount of weight of each of these lifts? So every time you lift it, you're lifting 200 pounds, right? So if you lift it 50 times, it's 200 pounds each time. So the average would be 200 pounds. Let's just say that we have a whole bunch of runners and they run the, they run a five second 440. Sorry, 40, that'd be unrealistic. So let's say they run a five second 40 and this person, another person on your track team runs a six second 40 and you got a super fast, uh, football player combine guy that runs it in four seconds. So what's the average speed of your runners? We add these up, right? So that's 15 and divide it by the number of runners. So the average speed is five seconds, right? This would be the average speed of the whole team. Does that make sense? If we did this, the average weight would be 200 pounds. Now, what's the total weight that you've lifted? You've done fit, you've lifted this 50 times. So it would be 200 times 50, which would be 10, right? 10,000 pounds. Could you lift 10,000 pounds at once? No. Probably not. 
So remember, the total is way different than average, right? The total speed of these is, you know, 15 seconds. So the reason that I'm asking you this is, let's say that we have a lake. We have a lake and we have a glass of water and they're both at the same temperature. Let's just say it's 70 degrees. This one looks colder, but we'll just say that. So they're both, they both have the same temperature. That means that all the water molecules in there have the same kinetic, average kinetic energy. But which one of these has the bigger total kinetic energy? The lake. The lake, right? Because there's way more molecules in here than there are in here. And so it's a lot harder to change the the temperature of the lake than it is to change the temperature of a glass of water. That's why in Arizona, if you have a small pool, like a kiddie pool, it gets really hot in the summer because there's not a lot of water in there to uh, maintain the temperature. You know, the bigger the pool, the more the water, the less the change in temperature. And it's because of these um, hydrogen bonds. Okay. Any questions about that? All right, so remember temperature is average kinetic energy, heat is total kinetic energy. Now we have water. Um, water has something called a high specific heat. That means it resists changes in temperature. Because if I wanna increase the kinetic energy of something, what do I have to do? Heat it up. Uh, well, remember, uh, we could add, so we could add energy to this, but I want you to think of it as a more basic thing. So what is kinetic energy? It's the energy of motion, right? If you were to define that, look it up in your book or whatever on Google, it would say uh, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So what do you think has more kinetic energy? Your car going down the street at 30 miles per hour or 80 miles per hour? 80? Yeah, because it's going faster. So if I want to change, if I want to increase the temperature, in other words, I want to increase the average kinetic energy of water, um, then that would mean I have to Professor, I think your mic may have stopped working. Okay, yeah, I know there's something going on with my, um, my USB drivers. So anyway, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah, I just had I just had a glitch in the system. I asked my kid if he was playing on my computer and he said no, but that doesn't really mean much. So uh, anyway, we're back. Uh, we want to increase the kinetic energy of something. We have to make the molecules move faster. Right, and to do that, um, we can increase the heat, but water resists this. It resists moving faster. So it takes a lot more heat, energy of heat, to get water molecules moving faster than it would other substances. Now, why do you think that is? Why would water resist Moving faster. Because it's 
bonds can no longer hold hands. It's a hydrogen bond. So let's right. let's just you know we could we could uh, you know correlate this to something that we know every day. So let's say that you had a bunch of hyperactive kids and they're on a playground and they're all jumping and running around, right? We would say that they have a high kinetic energy. They're moving all over the place. But now you force them to hold hands. What happens? They have to slow down. They can't. They can't move around as much, right? And that's what's going on with water. Water is holding hands through these hydrogen bonds, so it's not able to move around, just like the kids, unless what? They stop holding hands, right? So we have to break these hydrogen bonds. And that requires a lot more energy than it would if a substance didn't have hydrogen bonds. Like alcohol has very few hydrogen bonds as opposed to water. So it's it, you can change its specific heat a lot better. You know, and some things have uh, a higher specific heat uh, because it ha they have different chemical structures that hold them together to resist increases in kinetic energy. You know, like what do you put in your car's radiator? Water. Right, and the reason you do that is because water resists changes in temperature so your car doesn't overheat. You know, an antifreeze has different chemical properties that make it a little better than water, but not much. Water's really good at this and it's because of the hydrogen bonds. So, a couple definitions you need to know. Specific heat is the amount of energy uh, that must be absorbed or lost, so gained or lost. For one gram, and you guys might not know what a gram is yet, but when you get to the metric system lab, you will, of any substance. So it could be water, it could be alcohol, or whatever. And so every, all, every substance is going to have a different specific heat um, to change its temperature by one degree Celsius. So um, however much energy I have to put into water to make it go from one degree Celsius to two degrees Celsius, that's its specific heat. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the same thing with alcohol. So I might have to put less energy into alcohol to get it to change from one degree to two degrees or at you know one, one total degree Celsius. And then other substances and so on and so forth. Calories, right? Like you look at your nutritional label, you can see, you know, we talked about, I talked about a Sid and Nickers bar, 240 calories. Um, so that's the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So a calorie is essentially the specific heat of water, right? Because we're, but we're defining this to, as one gram of water. Because remember, the more water there is, the more energy we need to change its average kinetic energy. Like the lake versus the glass, it takes a lot more energy to heat up the lake than it does to heat up the glass. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's the specific heat of water, but it's only one gram of water, right? And so, um, you know, they, they measure calories with a calorimeter and basically what they would do is take a Snickers bar and burn it up and see, uh, how much, how many degrees they would change one gram of water. And so what would you think that would be? If it has, let's say we took a gram of water we put it in a thimble and we burned up a whole Snickers bar. How many degrees would that raise the temperature by? If it's 240 calories. You guys are afraid that you get the wrong answer. It's okay. If you already like knew this, 240? Knew this class, right? 240 degrees Celsius. So a Snickers bar would raise, uh, 
if we burned it up, it would raise one gram of water, 240 degrees Celsius. It would also raise 240 grams of water. How many degrees Celsius? One. Yeah. So we can interchange these. Right now, I'm going to sort of tell you that that's not true because the the food industry has tricked you as Americans. They don't do this in Europe. They use tools. But here, if you look at any food that's sold in the U.S., it's always in calories. And so when we when you look at a Snickers bar and it's 240 calories, that's actually kilo calories. Kilo is a thousand. So this is it's actually 240 thousand calories by scientific definitions. They just dropped off this because that seemed like too big of a number for people to process. So <laughs> if we if we look at the real value of a Snickers bar, okay, and I ask you on the test, if I burned up a real uh, a Snickers bar according to actual calories. So I, I took one gram of water and I burned up a Snickers bar uh, and we started at one degree Celsius. What will we end up as? 240,000. That's right, 240,000 degrees Celsius, which means that it, we can also raise the temperature of 240,000 grams of water, how much by burning up a Snickers bar? One. One degree Celsius. Right. So there's a lot of, the reason I'm showing you this is there's a lot of energy um, in, in sugars and proteins and carbs. And you use a lot of energy uh, in order to uh, be alive. So your body doesn't need a tiny, small amount of energy. It's massive. Um, if you think about an average diet is, you know, 2,000 calories per day, you know, two to three. So that's really 1,000 for every one of those. So you really need 2 million calories a day to, to, to live. And that means you could raise 2 million grams of water one degree Celsius if you burned it all up. And this, that's a massive amount of water. That's the swimming pool size equivalent of water. So that takes a lot of energy to do that. Any questions about water specific heat, calories? Nope. I'm gonna ask you on the test to do some calorie calculations like we just did. So be ready for it. All right, so we live in Arizona. It, it's unique because, you know, I'm, I'm actually from Texas and they don't really have evaporative cooling because it's so humid there. But when I moved out here, I noticed all the patios and all the restaurants and bars and, you know, people uh, even at their house that used evaporative cooling uh, in the form of mister systems. So, So you guys know that the, that Mister's on a patio on a hot summer day. What does it do to the temperature outside of the patio? It cools it down. Yeah, it's, it cools it down. So how does it do that? What is the magic behind this? And again, it's not magic. It's actually simple science. So let's go back to our race team, right? And let's say that we have six second, 40, five second 40, four second 40. And we know that this all adds up to 15. And if we divide it by three people, our average speed is five seconds, right? So you got these water molecules and they're moving all around in this mister system. And then you miss them so that they're, you know, hanging out. So uh, in the air. So what do you think is gonna leave the, Let's say we have a glass of water. We got all these molecules. Remember, they're, they're moving around inside this glass at different speeds. So what do you, which one do you think is gonna make the escape? The fast one or the slow one? Fast. 
Yeah, right. And so what happens to uh, the speed of our track team if the fastest person takes off? It makes it the average slower. Yeah, it makes the average slower. And so what happens if we make the average speed of the water slower? It cools. It decreases the temperature, right? And so it's the water is actually cooling down as opposed to the air because the air is actually heating up because the water molecules are going into the air. Does that make sense? And that's how evaporative cooling works. And that's why you sweat, right? Because you, you put liquid on your skin, it evaporates, the fast ones go into the air and it makes your skin cooler because the the sweat, the water left behind actually is reduced in temperature because that's the definition, right? The average kinetic energy of a system. So that's how evaporation, evaporative cooling works. Any questions about that? No. Nope. Awesome. Okay. Next is, you guys ever put, um, a water bottle in the freezer. We I, we do that a lot in Arizona, especially for the summer. What happens when you freeze a bottle of water? It expands the it, bottle. Yeah, it expands. That's exactly right. And if you took an ice cube and you put it in a glass of water, what does it do? Does it float or does it sink? Floats. So if it floats or it expands, that means that it's less dense. So you guys know just from common sense that solid water is less dense than liquid water because it floats and because it expands when you freeze it. So this is kind of uh, an interesting concept because what it means is, is that as we cool things, like you guys have gone probably in a lake, right? Or a pool and a real deep one. What happens when you go deeper in the lake? Does it get cooler or warmer? Cooler. That's warmer in the top. So if, if water was, uh, so you guys know water is cooler at the bottom than it is the top. So water has this weird, and most things get more dense as they cool. That's why water is cooler at the bottom of the lake. And so water will get less dense as it cools, but right when it hits four degrees Celsius, it actually gets starts getting less dense. And then water at freezing is less dense than all other water. And so what happens with uh, wa bodies of water? Do they freeze on the top or the bottom? The top. top. Now, if that was alcohol, it would freeze in the bottom and you would get layers and layers of frozen water uh, all the way up to the top. But it doesn't work that way. Water freezes on the top because of um, these hydrogen bonds. And I'll show you why in a second. Um, so th think about it this way. If, if you're trying to hold on to a kid that's jumping around and acting crazy, is that harder or easier than when they're calm? It's harder. So if we cool something down, like water, for example, the molecules in water, the colder they get, the less crazy they are, the less they move around, right? The easier it is to hold on to them. So the cooler the water, the more solid the hydrogen bonds will be, right? And the warmer the water, the less uh, solid or the less number of hydrogen bonds will form. When water gets to four degrees, 
that actually locks all the hydrogen bonds into place, all four, and that causes it to make all the water molecules move further apart from each other. And that's, and so they kind of lock into place. And so once it freezes, they freeze into place. And that's why ice floats. That's why uh, frozen water is less dense because of this effect of hydrogen bonds. And I'll, I'll show you that in a, in a slide in a second. But this is really important um, for life. Um, especially life in the ocean, because if water froze at the bottom all the way to the top, the oceans would probably still be frozen from the last ice age. Um, but frozen water on the top acts as an insulator. Sorry, I had to let the dog out. He's going to go crazy. Um, So this acts as an insulator, kind of like if you watch uh, those survival shows and they're in a snowstorm, they dig a tunnel to get into the snow, which sounds dumb, right? But the snow on top actually insulates their body temperature like a blanket. So frozen water on top actually insulates the water underneath from getting any cooler. And that, that's why there are lakes under Antarctica. And that's why, even though the surface of Europa, which we talked about in chapter one, is well below 200 degrees, um, we still think that there's liquid water under it. And what temperature would the coldest uh, liquid water be at? The very bottom of that ocean. The temperature that water is densest is four degrees. So at the bottom of the ocean of Europa, it's going to be four degrees because that's physics, not 40. That's a four, de that's a degree. And what you guys ever watched, like the deadliest catch or whatever, um, you know, they're out there and it's minus you know, 40 degrees, uh, the air temperature, and they're knocking ice off these ships. But they're catching these crabs that live at the bottom of the ocean. And what temperature is the bottom of the ocean on Earth? Four degrees. Yeah. So that's, we know that because if it was, if it was colder than that, it would start to rise. If it was three degrees, it would go higher. If it was two degrees, it'd go even higher. And at zero, it's right at the top. So um, four degrees is the maximum temperature, uh, density temperature of water. And that allows, you know, this liquid water to exist even on these super cold moons way out in outer space because of the property of water, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, we might, if we can find life on the bottom of our oceans, then there could be life at the bottom of oceans on these water moons like Europa. And we're not going to know until we visit it. But that would be definitely headlines, you think, if they found life on Europa? Yeah, for sure. OK, so I might ask you questions like, what's the temperature at the bottom of the ocean on the test? And you're going to tell me? Four Celsius. So make sure you write that down. It's probably going to be a test question. So this is what it looks like. When we get to solid water, it makes all four hydrogen bonds. And that spreads it out. You guys can see that this is much closer. So this is more dense. Liquid water is more dense. This is less dense. Density is the number of molecules in a given space. So that's why ice floats. When you freeze your water bottle, it expands. It's because of these hydrogen bonds are locking into place and spreading those water molecules out. Any questions? Nope. Awesome. OK. So this is just a drawing. This is from your book. You know, uh, what's the maximum number of hydrogen bonds that water can form? 
four. Awesome. What's the density of the maximum density of water? Temperature? Four degrees. Sweet. All right. So uh, liquid water, right? There, it makes less hydrogen on. Maybe it makes three because these things are all moving around really fast in this glass. Whereas here, they're locked into place. They're all holding hands. Um, and that's why ice floats. That's why we have uh, rake, lakes and rivers freeze on the top. And ice is an insulator too. So life wouldn't exist if that didn't occur. Water is a great solvent. And we're gonna talk about what a solvent is right now. So these are some terms you need to know. So a solution is a liquid that's completely homogeneous. Uh, this means same uh, mixture of two or more substances. So you guys ever buy milk? Or do yeah. you get it from a cow? You buy it? Yeah. And when you look on the milk label, it says it's homogenized. So you know that that means? So if you milk the cow, I don't know if you guys have done this before. Um, there's a lit, the fat floats to the top because you guys know that that oil and water don't mix. So you get this layer of fat on the top. So if you guys bought your milk and then had a big layer of fat on the top of it, would that be appealing to you? No. No. So in, and dairy farmers figured this out too. So what they do is they take it and they mix it they homogenize it, which comes from this word homogeneous, which means to mix thoroughly, right? So a homogeneous mixture is a thoroughly mixed mixture. And when they homogenize your milk, it mixes the oil and the water in the milk uh, completely so that you can't tell the difference. It's all the same throughout the whole gallon of milk. Uh, and that's two or more substances. So in this case, it would be oil and water, but this could be, uh, you know, salt and water or sugar and water or whatever, anything that mixes. If I put sand in water, can I make a homogeneous mixture? No. No, because the sand would come out, it doesn't dissolve. All right, so when we're, when we're dissolving things, like, let's say we're making salt water, which is basically what an IV is. If, so if we want to make an IV, let's say there's a bus accident and we're going to, lots of people are losing blood and we're going to make some IVs for them. Then we're going to make a solution that's going to be salt and water. And so when we're talking about these two things, the solvent is the dissolving agent. What's causing it to dissolve? In this case, it's water, right? Because if we didn't have water, the salt would just hang out in the air. And then the solute, in this case, that's the thing that's being dissolved, is salt. So the solvent here is water, and the solute is salt. What if we're making sugar water? What's the solvent? Want the water. Good. What's the solvent? Solute. Sugar. And together we call this a mixture. Right, which is defined as a solution. All right. We talk about aqueous solutions. So we could we could try to dissolve we could dissolve things in alcohol. And so alcohol would be the solvent. But if we're using water, we use the word aqueous. Aqua is water. Um, so water, when we talk about an aqueous solution, water is always the solvent. And water isn't a universal solvent, but it's very versatile because of the, the water molecules. And I'll show you why in a second. So this is a, these are, remember we have the orbitals. So remember we have sodium, we have chlorine that's negatively charged and sodium that's positively charged. And remember, the reason this happened is because sodium gave up one of its electrons to chlorine, which made it negative, and because chlorine and sodium lost the electron, it's positive. And then 
positive and negatives attract. So they got kind of stuck together like magnets. But remember, they still have a charge. And what kind of bond is this? Because they transferred electrons. Make sure you guys know this for the test. Is that covalent? No. Ionic? Yeah. So transfer of electrons is ionic. Sharing of electrons is covalent. Um, so sodium, sodium chloride is an ionic bond. Um, and so the plus of sodium is attracted to the minus of chlorine, and that's why they hang out like that. But water's slippery, you know. So water can kind of get in here and split these two up just temporarily uh, into their individual ions. Remember that term, ion is a charge. So is this a anion or a cation? Cation. <laughs> cation. <laughs> Maybe. Yes. Remember, cata means down. So it's lost its electron and got smaller. And then chlorine is an anion. Remember, like anabolic steroids pump you up. So chlorine got bigger because it got another electron. So this is a this is an anion. These are both ions because they're charged. So that's what this is drawn out here. So sodium and chlorine. This is just a big block of salt right here. Sodium, chlorine. We know positive is representing sodium. Uh, chlorine is represented the negative. And then we throw the water in there, right? So water gets in between these guys and splits them up, which is shown here in this drawing. And these molecules are water. This is a hydrogen. I'm sorry. This is an oxygen. The red molecule is an oxygen. The white ones are hydrogens here. So oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and so on. So a bunch of water molecules are going to surround chlorine. Remember, chlorine's negative charged. So in water, what's the charge on the hydrogen part? So electrons spend more time around oxygen than hydrogen. So what would the charge be on oxygen? Negative. Yeah. And then what would be the charge on hydrogen? Positive. Yeah. So these things, water is going to line up based on charges, just like a magnet. So what do you think, what side is going to surround a negative chlorine molecule, the hydrogen or the oxygen? In the other hydrogen? words, what would be attracted, which side of this molecule would be attracted to negative chlorine? positive hydrogen. Right. And that's why it's drawn like this. You can see the hydrogens are all lined up around the chlorine. You guys see that? It's yeah. on the oxygen side. And then we could flip the script here. So which what side would surround sodium that's positive charged? And the answer is the negative oxygen. So you guys see that the oxygens are all the side that's surrounding the sodium. And so now we've got, it's called a water shell. It's kind of like throwing a, a blanket over something so you can't see it anymore, but it, you know it's still there. And that's what water does. It's just hiding the ions by surrounding it like a blanket. And that's what things that, that's what dissolving is. You're not getting rid of them, you're just hiding them. So you can't see them anymore because water surrounds them. I know it's a weird concept, but it, that's really what happens. And water wouldn't be able to do this if, if these molecules didn't have a charge. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, if you guys go back and look, and, and I'm not gonna go back, uh, but I'll just remind you and you guys can go back and check it out and if you want to go uh, recap the lecture and you don't remember this. But when we look at 
uh, fats like lipids and you're going to do this in your chemistry thing in your chemistry lab lipids are made out of carbons and hydrogens we call these hydrocarbons and and carbon electronegativity is 2.5 and hydrogens is 2.1 so the difference between these two is 0.4 now, now, I'm not sure if you remember the rules or not, but that's less than 0.5. So that means that there's no charge. No uh, charge, and that means they're non-polar. So all fats are non-polar, which means they have no charge. And if they don't have a charge, water can't surround them like it does here. So that's why water cannot dissolve in fats because there's no charge. So I'm gonna tell you something that's really important right now that you need to know for this class. And that is, and you guys know water is important to life, right? So you might've asked yourself, uh, will we find life on, on other planets that don't have water? And the answer is probably not because um, inside your cell, if things weren't dissolved, they wouldn't be able to move around very easily. It would be kind of like if I put uh, a bag of potatoes in the corner of a ship and change you to the other side. Would you ever be able to get to those potatoes? No, but if I filled it half full of water, the potatoes would float around and you would eventually get them. So we need to be able to dissolve stuff to move uh, sugars and things like that in our blood to different cells. So it has to be dissolved. Um, and I, t I lost my train of thought here, but um, the thing that important thing I was going to tell you is that water can dissolve anything that is charged. So any molecule that has a charge, water can dissolve it. If it doesn't have a charge, water cannot dissolve it. So water can only dissolve polar molecules. It cannot dissolve nonpolar molecules. All right. Any questions about that? No. Awesome. All right. So that brings us to the next thing. So when we talk about if water can dissolve it or not, we're, we kind of use these words philic and phobic. Philic means loving, uh, phobic means fearing, and then hydro is water. So if it's water loving, then it means that it can be dissolved. And that means that it's polar or ionic, right? They have a charge or it has to have a charge. Hydrophobic means that uh, it's water fearing. fearing. And so that means it doesn't have an affinity for water. And these are nonpolar molecules like fat that we just talked about. And those are found in cell membranes. So if we look at a cell, right? The most of the cell is made out of water. You guys know you're mostly water. You probably learned that a long time ago in science. And so if you wanna make a, an enclosed space like a house to keep all your stuff safe, your DNA and all that good junk, you wouldn't wanna build your house out of paper because what happens when water encounters paper? It dissolves it. Yeah, it dissolves it. So you want something that can't be dissolved to make up the walls of your your house, your cell. And so those are made up of fats because water can't dissolve that. So there's a reason all cells are made up of fats. All right. So the when we make up solutions, we need to know the concentration of the solutes in these water solutions. And to do, and so all of this is based on weight or mass. 
we use the term mass because things weigh differently. Uh, like, let's say you weigh differently on the moon than you would on Earth. And we try to keep this universal. So we try to use mass because that doesn't change uh, based on where you're at on the Earth. Like, if you are, you would weigh less on the top of Mount Everest than you do in Phoenix because it's further away from the Earth's core. So there's less gravitational pull on you. Uh, okay, so uh, the molecular weight, we talked about this in chapter two, like uh, we talked about hydrogen is one gram and helium is four grams and so on and so forth. So sodium, and you, you'll, this is why you need a periodic table. Uh, hang on a second. Brad, I'm recording a lecture. Um, so sodium's 23. Um, remember we said that these were actually Daltons, but we're just gonna erase the word Dalton and put the word gram on here. So chlorine, sodium uh, is 23 Daltons, chlorine is 35.5 Daltons. So we, if we have sodium chloride, we just add them together because they're a one-to-one -one ratio. And that's 23 plus 35.5, which is 58.5 Daltons. All right, so we get rid of the word Dalton and we just add gram. And so 58.5 grams is, what, and we use this new word called a mole, is one mole of a substance. So a mole is the amount of that substance that has its mass in grams equivalent to its molecular weight in Dalton. So basically that's a wordy way of saying, we just get rid of the Daltons, we add grams and we call it a mole. So one mole of salt would weigh 58.5 grams. So if I ask you to bring me a mole of sodium chloride, you would pour it on the scale until it weighed 58.5 grams. So let's try another one. What's the molecular, so I'll just give you this oxygen. And on the test, I'm gonna to try to give you these numbers. Uh, it would still help to bring, to print out that periodic table and have it with you. But um, I'll try to add these on the test. I think I've done all of them on there. So you might, you probably don't need much of a periodic table, but. Uh, oxygen's mass is 16 Daltons. So we just convert that to grams. We just forget Daltons. And so what's the molecular, what's the, if I ask you to bring me a mole of water, what would you bring me? How many grams of water? Would it be one gram? Uh, no, because we have to account for all of this. So what's hydrogen's, remember we take hydrogen's molecular weight and Dalton's and we make it grams. So how many hydrogens are there? There's two. So we have hydrogen is one gram. We have to add another gram to it. So two grams of its weight would come from, we're just converting Dalton's to grams. So two grams of its weight would become from this H2. And then we have one oxygen and what does it weigh? 16 Dalton's where we make it grams. And then we just add it together. So you would be 18 grams of water is one mole of water. Does it make sense? Yeah. All right. Uh, and then when you guys do the metric system, the whole metric system was based on the weight of water. Like it was just a made up system by the French. So a gram of water is actually one uh, milliliter of water which is one cubic centimeter of water. You know, in, in medicine, they use CC. I'd never use that. I use millimeters because I'm a scientist, not a physician. But uh, so I, I know for a fact, if you poured uh, 18 milliliters of water out, that that would weigh 18 grams and that would also be one mole of water. So super easy to calculate this out. All right, so let's try another one.
and then and then we'll call it a day. I didn't realize that how long how late this has gone because I was looking at this for a quarter and that kind of stopped. All right, so one. Uh, let's do C six H twelve O six. So I'll give you that carbon is twelve, hydrogen is one, oxygen is sixteen. So remember, these are grams. We just convert it to grams. So how many carbons do we have? This is glucose, by the way. Twelve. So we multiply this by twelve, and we get one hundred and forty-four grams. And then hydrogen. How many hydrogens are there? Oh, I'm sorry. So six times twelve would be seventy-two. This is 12, so that would be 12 grams. And then oxygen is times six. That would be 96. And if we add this all up, two plus two plus six is zero, right? Seven, uh, eight, and nine, it would be 180 grams, would be one mole of glucose. And so you could, we could check our work here. Um, this is sucrose, but you guys can practice on this one. Um, glucose is 180 grams. So sucrose is different. Uh, any questions about that? Okay, so I'm gonna stop here and jump over to office hours. If you guys have any other questions you wanna ask me, you can come to office hours and then uh, otherwise I'll, I'll uh, see you again on Thursday. Okay, thank you. All right, have a good one. Sorry Bye, thank you. Over.